Continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1 800 618 8255. 1 800 618 TALK. First time callers, area code 702 727 1222. 702 727 1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702 727 1295. 727 1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Now again, here I am. My guest is Harvard professor John Mack, and we'll get back to him in just a moment. Um, uh, I would say a million questions to ask. We'll never have time for all of them. I do promise you uh, we will get the telephone lines open shortly, so stay right where you are. Harvard professor John Mack. Dr. Mack. Yes, right. Um, Dr. Mack, what about, we were talking about the way people are affected by this. What about the generally deeply religious people? How are they affected? Well, sometimes, the, at first, like there's one man that was raised as a, a, a fundamentalist Christian, and initially he thought uh, that these were demons, and the people in his community said that they were demons. Mm -hmm. And then he realized that they were something else. He wasn't quite sure what, but that it was some kind of uh, actual beings or some kind of actual experience that was occurring in his life and that he had a relationship with these creatures and that uh, this was something different than his religious training. Uh, a lot of times when people are not familiar with the uh, abduction syndrome, uh, religious people will say, well, this, this is the work of the devil that, uh, that God would never appear in such a strange form of humanoid beings and they they get uh, labeled uh, as embodiment of, of, of demons but um, the people uh, th there's no particular uh, pattern uh, of religious background associated with this or reaction that's associated with different kinds of, of religious experience, which is one of the reasons, by the way, why the, the uh, uh, phenomenon uh, seems to me to be so uh, reveal, uh, so real and so robust, because uh, it, it, is, it kind of um, takes precedence over people's religious experience. In other words, they may, uh, uh, it doesn't, it's not an expression of some kind of, of religious background. It has its own shape and form, which cuts across all uh, religious backgrounds. Huh. Um, d is there any indication uh, with all of your research about what these beings want or what the focus of their attention is during these abductions? The difficulty with that question is that that what they... I mean, then you're dealing with uh, sort of alien psychology, but uh, what, <laughs> what the, the pattern that, that tends to occur has to do with some kind of, I don't know what you would call it, but I guess reproductive, uh, what, uh, joining with us, perhaps, is the, is the best way. In other words, that there's over and over and over again, there's a description of uh, sperm being taken from men mm. uh, over... Uh, eggs from women, reimplantation of a, a fertilized uh, egg with something done to it through the alien principle, whatever this is, then the uh, fetus removed from the woman later on, 
uh, all of this again, and then uh, then finally uh, the um, abductee being taken to see these hybrid uh, offspring uh, in the craft. So there's some uh, some kind of reproductive uh, program here. Now again, um, I don't take this quite as literally as some of my uh, colleagues do. In other words, I I don't know again in what reality this is occurring. No, there is not a um, documented case of an actual pregnancy that was uh, uh, tested for and then found mysteriously to be uh, removed. Uh, there's no question there's some uh, physiological changes occur in the women and they experience uh, a fetus being taken. No, no question about that. And it's not, a, it's not simply their imagination. But, but uh, I'm, I'm very leery about... Uh, Saying that any of these things uh, occur literally in our reality. I mean, that, as you said in the in the um, what do you call it, the program notes for your the beginning of your program, uh, that even though things are strange and not necessarily in our reality, it doesn't make them any less real. That's right. But they're not necessarily real in the literal physical terms. For example, uh, nobody's actually got a picture of these hybrid beings or the aliens at all, for that matter. Um, that that's reliable. Um, but to the abductees, and this is not a delusion, uh, the, these are, the, their connection with these hybrid beings is, is very powerful. And in fact, one of the most poignant things that uh, a person can go through who works with abductees is to take them through the memory of being taken into the ship and uh, confronted with a hybrid uh, being and uh, told, this is yours, and they sort of know it's theirs because it sort of looks like them and then asked to hold this creature and to nurture it. Wow. And, and they know that uh, they have no control of when they'll ever see it again, and yet they feel somehow they are supposed to bond with this creature or it won't do well. And, and it's, a, it's a very real and disturbing phenomenon. And a woman may weep on my uh, couch when, when that... Uh, is recalled. So again, it has something to do with re reproduction, obviously. All right. So, so that's one thing, but that's not the whole story. Uh, is that that uh, another very powerful part, and this is, uh, again, there's a fair amount of controversy about this. Uh, uh, another powerful part has to do with what might be called um, um, ecological messages. Mm -hmm. uh, now, is that, that um, a message comes through to the humans that you are, you humans, are treating the earth as if you owned it, as, as if uh, it was here just for you huh. to destroy, to uh, exploit, to, as a kind of giant marketplace to be consumed, disposed of, and uh, uh, for the, the purpose of this one uh, species that has developed the technology to uh, of agriculture and of... Uh, city building and uh, mining and uh, uh, basically the, the power to to remove the surface of the earth and its resources and, and destroy the earth as a living system. And over and over and over again, the communication comes to us uh, from these beings, and, and it's powerfully felt by the abductees, this can't go on. In other words, this is not yours to do this with. Now... Uh, do you get do you get the sense, Doctor? They are saying this uh, to us as our creators, or simply as concerned beings. There, there's nothing to suggest that they. The, uh, often the abductees, and again, this is quite controversial. And in UFO circles, I'm I'm sort of seen as kind of uh, you know gone soft New Age or something. But there's nothing soft or New Age about this. This is a hard edged reality that is being smashed into. Uh, the abductees with tremendous power and which shakes them up uh, enormously and these are not people that necessarily you know, environmentalists they're often uneducated <laughs> people who hadn't thought about these things and one man said but I'm just a simple person what am I supposed to do about the earth you know and they said well you got to find a way because you love nature and you don't want to see the earth destroyed and then he's become very very active uh, and hmm. concerned uh, uh, about uh, this I mean other, other a woman that uh, got this message began teaching in, uh, about ecology in the classroom and getting the other teachers to, to include that in their courses. I mean, another man uh, who had a very powerful abduction experience at age nine, which uh, uh, deeply uh, filled 
his mind with, with uh, images of the destruction of the earth, and he's become one of the most uh, extraordinary businessmen in terms of, of his commitment to the sustainability of the earth's living system. So it's a, it's a very real, very powerful part of this thing. And often the abductees will, rather than saying this is directly from the Creator, will will see the uh, alien beings as, as emissaries from some divine source. Intermediaries is often the word they use, that they're closer to the source than, than we are. They're often um, described as, as well, the one type are they call directly light beings. They're not all grays. They're these taller, more luminous beings that they call light beings. But, but even the little grays themselves are seen as, as uh, being more uh, closely connected with the source of creation. Wow. Um, I see. I, that almost stops me. I, <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. What about uh, children versus adults? In the cases that you have studied, how many have involved children? They are particularly interesting, of course. Yeah, I've seen about uh, eight or ten children now who have this syndrome, uh, two of them under three, which, by the way, are, is one of the uh, reasons why it's very difficult to... Uh, utilize any kind of fancy personality theory to explain uh, the abduction uh, story because uh, it would be difficult to apply such theories to children as young as uh, two and a half when a, a little boy, uh, as in that case of mine, says, uh, Mommy, um, the the owls came, because, you know, the, the, the big eyes often make the children think of owls. The owls came in the night, and uh, or uh, Mommy, the the little men uh, came in the night and took me into the sky, and you didn't stop them. Uh, yeah. They say it with fear. It's hard to uh, attribute that to some kind of, you know, uh, deep-seated uh, personality problem. Sure is. They don't have one yet. Uh, well, that's remarkable, and it, I, I, would, I would guess it would take a very sensitive uh, adult or parent to discern what's happened to this child versus just the usual, you had a bad dream, dear. Yeah, but if the child over and over again points to the sky and says, "I went up there last night, and you know they 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 took me up, and uh, and the house went away," uh, you know, uh, mm. and they say that very clearly and vividly, uh, uh, it it uh, it doesn't sound like a nightmare. No, it doesn't. Um, although I still think most parents would say, well, you just had a bad dream, dear. Well, that may be. In other words, it may be that the ones where the parents come to realize that this is something more than a bad dream may be the minority. There may be lots of cases out there, uh, even in your radio audience, where um, uh, the, the parents haven't realized what was going on. Huh. Um, well, all right. Um, I would very much like to get to the telephones, which we'll do shortly. But, uh, Dr. Mack, I would like to, um, uh, I guess I'd like to um, uh, first ask you about your critics and what you would like to say to your critics. Um, you're in a very prestigious position. Uh, you've really got your neck out. Uh, what made you stick your neck out? And now that it's out, uh, how do you handle your critics? Well, I get criticized from all sorts of directions. I mean, uh, the most the serious uh, uh, critics are the ones that um, say that uh, well, you can't prove this with physical evidence, therefore uh, uh, you can't claim that anything extraordinary is, is going on here. And uh, my answer to that is that uh, we have to expand our notions of evidence. Now, as my strong suit, as I said earlier, is clinical diagnosis. Now, as when you uh, have uh, thousands of people reporting uh, in great detail uh, very, very similar accounts, which they themselves are skeptical about. They themselves have not, as the woman that we talked about earlier, have not read about this. Uh, they are doubters, and they're troubled when they hear that somebody else has had the experience. It shocks them. When you hear, and, and the narratives are spoken about reluctantly, when you hear something like that, you know that you're dealing with something that occurred, something that, that happened to people. That's not the way psychosis works or dreams work or displacements from other kind of traumas. 
this is something happened. Now, all right. Well, if you, doctor, if you were asked uh, for evidence, physical evidence, to prove um, most psychiatric diagnosis, it would not be possible, would it? That's right. And uh, but the thing about this that I've said over and over again, this simply cannot be. In other words, in our worldview, uh, the universe cannot contain intelligences that behave like this. In other words, we we don't believe that there are other intelligences that. Uh, other than, than that which is a uh, part of the human imagination. So mm -hmm. when these beings show up as real and enter our physical world, and actually in some occasions uh, uh, people are witnessed to be missing during the abduction. Children will find their parents missing, or uh, parents will uh, find their... Uh, well, it works both ways. Children find the parents missing, parents find the children missing, friends find each other gone. I mean, that, that there are not a lot of those well-documented, that, but there are some. Uh, or there are the whole variety of physical findings that we're familiar with of uh, cuts and scoop marks and mm -hmm. uh, complex patterned uh, ulcers and other lesions on people's bodies that follow the abduction experiences. Uh, those, those physical findings are important. They, they wouldn't stand up by themselves medically, you know, just on their own. But when you combine them with the experiences, you've got a whole... And the fact that this occurs in such young children and people are of sound mind, you have a whole... And, the, and of course, what tends to be forgotten is there's the, a very tight association with UFOs here. In other words, the UFO That's right. may be observed in the community by uh, when the abductee hasn't seen it themselves. In other words, that a I have cases where a neighbor says, you know, there was a funny-looking craft over your house, uh, <laughs> and the person, oh, my God, I, I, and they, they've had an abduction experience. Or a famous case up our way where a UFO was tracked by virtually all the media in a northeasterly direction and uh, and uh, abductees reporting their experiences that coincided with the media tracking of the UFOs. Now, as you, you've got to take this entire set of phenomena together, together mm -hmm. if you're going to account for this. Just to single out some sort of psychological aspect of the person that misses much of, of the phenomenon. So, um, and my critics tend to do that. In other words, they say, well, I'm just sort of gullible about believing these people. Well, it's not a matter of believing them. It's a matter of, of the fact that uh, the, most, uh, cons the, the, the most economical explanation of, of what the person is reporting is that they're telling the truth. And uh, even if the truth isn't supposed to be, uh, mm -hmm. the fact that something can't exist doesn't keep it from happening. Indeed. Um, uh, speaking of that and keeping it from happening, I would think that uh, one thing they would desperately want is to prevent it from occurring again if it scared them or they found it disagreeable, which I assume most do. Is there a way, is there any way at all to prevent it? Well, Ann Druffel and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Easel Brenman and uh, North Carolina, uh, people have tried to, to develop ways of doing that. I, my, my people have not been too successful with that and 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 also you know the, the one of the most curious things about this and here again this is a controversial area within the ufo abduction researchers or you know investigators so we say themselves uh, yes. is that uh the phenomenon in my experience changes over time in other words that the as the person goes deep into their experience and acknowledges the reality of it and demands as in some cases a more reciprocal more equal relationship with the alien beings, the, the, the experience changes. It becomes more reciprocal. There is an exchange of information. The people are often uh, work alongside the aliens, or they feel they're part of some evolutionary process in which uh, this uh, life of, uh, is being planned for a, a future after human beings have uh, destroyed the Earth as, as a living system. In other words, this is part, they feel they're part of some larger cosmic evolutionary uh, process and they themselves uh, undergo some kind of, of spiritual change and they may participate in this hybrid program much more willingly and it becomes less of a traumatic kind of experience, hard as that may be to believe. Kind of like learning to love the bomb. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, it, that's the, that, I think that's the, one of the major questions here. Is this simply like that? In other words, it's an evil, but we've uh, adapted to it. Or is this in some way a... Um, by its very nature, uh, a spiritually evolutionary 
kind of phenomenon because a lot of people feel that, that it is. Sounds, people, sounds like you believe that it is. Yeah. Do you advise? I don't know. I, I think that there's so many of the people when they go deeply into their experience, stay with it, and go through, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight sessions, they come to a place where there's very great spiritual growth, deep love between them and the alien beings, which is not just, you know, the mm -hmm. Stockholm Syndrome where you sort of love your captors or something. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a, there's a, one of the men in my book, uh, Peter, uh, talked about a lost brotherhood that we, we, uh, and another, a number of abductees have talked about this, that they, we derive from a common source. We were separated. That's maybe why they're humanoid, that they, that we grew separately in some kind of evolution of beings or consciousness from some common divine source and that this, this is a coming back together in the context of the ecological crisis on the planet. All right, we're about at the bottom of the hour, Doctor, but is that what you encourage when somebody wants to know how to handle it? Do you encourage them to move in that direction? I don't encourage anything. What I do uh, allow the person to do is to have their experience. In other words, to be with them, to hold the energy with them, to allow the trauma to unfold, and to go with them wherever they're going to go. All right. I, uh, I have been accused of influencing people, for instance, and... Uh, woman that transcribed 2,200 pages of tapes of mine says there's not one sentence All right, we, in doctor, we've got influenced to, anybody. Doctor, we've got to break off there. Prof Harvard professor John Mack, right back. With Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255, 1-800-618-8255. First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222, or the wildcard line at 702-727-1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. And this is a very unusual opportunity for you to speak with Dr. Uh, Harvard professor Dr. John Mack, and we're going to go to the telephones in just a moment, so if you're ready, I think we're ready. Dr. Mack, are you there? Yep. Good. I have one question before we go to the telephones, and it is, we know about the abductions um, that, um, uh, that people tell you about and many others about because they come back to tell us. But there are, uh, in this country and others, many missing children, many missing adults. Do you suppose, Dr. Mack, there are abductions where the person is not returned? I don't think so. I, I just don't think that's the way it works. I mean, I, my, I, don't, I haven't studied that, but I, my sense is that that's, those are more human, human kidnappings. I mean, the... the uh, because, we, you know, with, the, with certain exceptions, like the Travis Walton case, which was uh, made into this movie, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is it... Uh, fire in the sky that that's right that um uh he was gone for five or six days but uh usually it's a matter of two or three hours you know it's not not a long phenomenon and there may be cases where you know i i did hear of one case where a airplane small airplane disappeared out in the bermuda triangle uh area and but i mean you can't really uh it didn't go into the water but you know it was taken up but sure. uh, at least that was the that was the uh, no, I don't recollection of, of uh, people that, that studied it, but I, I don't think it's it's not well corroborated, and I, I don't really believe that there are uh, there's any evidence that, that those are abduction cases. This is the end of side one. Please leave the cassette exactly where it is. Flip it. Yeah, I, one last last question, then we'll go to the phones. Um, if you were faced with an abduction. Yourself, Doctor Mack, with all you know about abductions, would you submit to it given choice, or would you run like hell? Oh God! You know, it's a strange thing. I mean, where we're located in the culture. I mean, I, I have this. I, I've never had an abduction experience, and I, I, I you know, uh, I think that uh, this is so controversial, and uh, I, I think they're protecting me. You know, I think. I mean, if I. Um, in one sense, I'd sort of like to know what it's like so I could uh, authenticate it more easily for people. On the other hand, I think probably my credibility would suffer, so I, I probably am better off... Uh, so you might submit to it, but not tell anybody? 
<laughs> I suppose. Uh, if, you, if you admit you've had these experiences, yeah, that's, that's right. just another way of disqualifying you. you know? that, that is, oh, that's exactly right, Doctor. Let's try a few telephone calls, see what's out there. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Hi. Yes, Dr. Rod, you have... I have a list of the doctors that were on that uh, information uh, default memory board. Some of them are, are worked on Project Pandora, Slammer, and MK Ultra, and some others. I was trying to find it to fax you uh, or to fax to the station. All right, are you wanting a list of um, uh, researchers, ma'am? Is that it? No, I have them. You have them. I have. Them. I would imagine. I would imagine Dr. Mack does as well. All right. Thank you uh, uh, very much. First time caller line. You're on the air with Harvard professor John Mack. Hi. Um. Yes. Hi. Where are you, ma'am? I'm um, San Diego. San Diego. Uh huh. What is your question? I wanted to ask him why it is possible to somehow either audio or videotape record people's bedrooms that have repeat experiences and maybe get something on. Um, Tape or film. All right. A lot of people have tried to do that. The question is, you know, why why don't we have more audio tapes and video tapes? And um, people try to do that, and and uh, you know, it, it's they they re they will report some buzzing sound or beeping sound, and then you listen to the audio tape, and you never I'm never quite convinced it's you know that that clear. And uh, video tapes is one case that uh, Bud Hopkins reports where the they had a videotape running all night, and uh, uh, you see uh, uh, people, there's no videotape of the actual abduction, but you see somehow the, mach the, the videotape gets turned off, and you see the uh, people before the abduction, then you see them in a somewhat different relationship or coming back after the abduction, but you never see anything in between. And... Um, one of the properties that this phenomenon has, the energy properties, is to uh, uh, affect all kinds of tricks with electronic media. I mean, it would be, it would be, if they did not, they, whatever this they is, did not want to be discovered, they would have no problem in incapacitating a video camera. I mean, that would be... Uh, Ch child's play. Uh, child's play to them, sure. Uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Hi. Hi. Yes, sir. Uh, turn your radio off and tell us where you're calling from, please. I'm calling from the St. Louis area. My name is uh, Forrest Crawford. And oh, Forrest, nice hi. to hear you in St. Louis, John. How are you doing? Pretty good. Um, I've got a, a question relating to people who have experiences with aliens that are not fearful, for instance, of their experiences, or they come away with, with more than a traumatic uh, rendition of that experience. And then compared to someone else, who has an experience, say, with the exact kind, same kind of aliens and the same uh, taxonomy and scenario happens, but then they're very fearful and traumatized. Um, basically, I'm asking uh, for you to, to comment on what do you think attributes to that? So that I think, there I think that the psychology or psychiatry might have something to offer. Uh, in other words, uh, I have, for example, uh, there's uh, the last uh, case in my book is the case of a man in his late 30s, a businessman, who uh, has what I would call a very a kind of advanced state of consciousness. In other words, he's open to anything that's possible. He doesn't. He's not a someone who has to be in control. He's a person that can let in experience. And when he was nine years old, a huge UFO, uh, you know, illuminated the car that his mother was driving. They were coming back from the movies in upstate New York, and there were two of his uh, his older sister, older brother, uh, younger brother. I'm sorry, were in the car. And everybody but him was frightened. In other words, that the, the mother was terrified, the sister was frightened, the little boy was frightened, and the mother sort of pushed them down, and he was all excited. And he, he was uh, accepted this thing, and he felt there was a communication from the beings that were in the craft, and in the hypnosis session, he was actually taken up into the craft and, and given all kinds of information about the future and what he was supposed to do and this kind of thing. There was nothing traumatic about it at all. In other words, he was open, receptive, he had that kind of consciousness, whereas I think people that are that are more closed in themselves, more restricted in their minds, more uh, wanting to maintain uh, control of everything around them, are, are more likely to have a, a traumatic experience. It, it seems to be that there's some relationship between the, the evolution or state of consciousness of the abductee 
and the nature of the experience. So it, it may be uh, their paradigm could be causing their uh, difference in reaction to the experiences. I, something like that. There is something in the state of mind, the receptivity, the openness. I mean, I've known, for example, a, a woman who is a, a leader in, uh, uh, you know, uh, understanding, uh, you know, shamanism and, and consciousness change and, and uh, evolutionary thinking, uh, whose abduction experiences from the beginning have been informational with luminous beings and not with the sort of uh, tough little grays. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, doctor, can, have you made any determination about how many different types of uh, beings have been described to you? To me, about five kinds. But there, but there are people that have more information about that than, uh, than, I, than I do. Uh, uh, Jim Harder, for instance, in the Berkeley area, he knows uh, you know, many more types than, than I do. He's been studying this for 20 years. Linda, knows, has, has described, Linda Howe has described yes. uh, all kinds. I, I've, uh, my, mine have been restricted to the, what, the, the little grays, the more taller luminous beings, the uh, sort of reptilian-looking ones, sometimes mm -hmm. uh, praying mantis-like uh, creatures are seen, and then various um, uh, sort of more human-looking ones uh, that work alongside the, the other beings uh, on the ships. But I, I mean, I, I'm not uh, an alien uh, demographer. I understand. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Hello, where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from uh, Northern California, Art. Yes, sir. You have a great show tonight. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask Dr. Mack if there's any um, uh, similarities between the uh, people that have been uh, abducted significant. Now, that's a very good question, and the fact that there, uh, as far as we can tell, is not, uh, uh, there are, have not been any psychological characteristics uh, found, uh, is, again, one of the pieces of evidence that we're dealing with something that isn't related to the personality or personal background or conflicts of the individuals. There are people that have had very disrupted, unhappy lives from or from working class families, that, but there are also cases from very wealthy families, professional families where it's been very uh, loving, intact uh, families, as in the case of the businessman that I talked about earlier was the last chapter in, in my book. There's every type of profession represented, uh, including psychiatrists, uh, diplomats, uh, Writers. All right, so it's, it's very diverse. What about a mix between male and female? Is there any uh, anything noticeable there? Well, uh, it depends. Uh, uh, Thomas Bullard found more men in, in his survey. Uh, other people have found more women. Hmm. Uh, I, it seems fairly equal. I, I think that the men uh, may have somewhat more trouble reporting their experiences because there's a, a little bit more... Shame connected with it. Barrier, them. kind of a barrier, you know. Because to be so helpless, so so passively unable to do anything is is really terrible for women and men. But it's it's particularly uh, uh, shame traumatic for men, or shame they, they don't often tell you about it. Uh, That's really. right, because a man has a kind of a control thing, doesn't he? A little more, yeah. I mean, to be made helpless, have a cup put over the penis, and. Uh, and sperm taken. The first case in my book is a man who, uh, when he was uh, 16, he and his friend were uh, in a Nash uh, Rambler, and, and they were sleeping, and uh, and the uh, beings came, and they took him into, a woman took him into, a female being took him into a pod, and he described some sort of, you know, in a somewhat macho way, a, a sexual encounter, and then the... Uh, than the uh, information that was given to him about the state of the earth and so forth. And, but uh, under hypnosis, this um, turned out to be much more uh, humiliating. Notice it was the more typical uh, cup put over his penis and the female That's being in charge uh, sort of watched over this and said, you know, we're not here for sex and they we're here to take your sperm. And, uh, and he found it really quite, quite uh, uh, humiliating. So... Um, so he modified the story when he told uh, it. Uh, when he told the story consciously, which again relates to the question about hypnosis. I mean, here his conscious recall because he wanted to represent himself to himself and to me in a more favorable light was less accurate in my view than what came out 
when he was relaxed under hypnosis and uh, and brought forth what was a much more typical account of being uh, forced into this situation. So, Gee, the diversity in the stories is in itself revealing, isn't it? Yeah, and it, it tends to, to counter the notion that hypnosis is distorting because the, the conscious ego did more distorting in that situation than the hypnosis. Exactly. Um, all right, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Good evening. No, I guess you're not. On the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Hello. Hello, yes. Um, Where are you calling from, sir? Missoula. Missoula, Montana. All right. Yeah. Um, have you ever considered the possibility that these creatures are not aliens, but maybe they're from the future? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, the dimensional question. You mentioned uh, the possibility of other dimensions earlier. Yeah. Uh, do you, what is your thinking on this? Well, I, I think that uh, it's a good question. I was, uh, that um, there's no reason to believe that uh, that uh, entities, beings that have the technology to uh, have UFOs that can flick on and off the radar screen, that can go uh, 7,000 miles an hour in one direction, make a sharp right angle turn, and with no skid, in other words, they've overcome any uh, uh, ideas we have about gravity. Um, and that uh, they can float people through walls, evidently, and uh, there's no reason to believe that they wouldn't be able to to uh, move through time in some way. You know, is that that's certainly a possibility. Uh, so, um, what was the other part of your question? Well, uh, he's gone now, but that that was the basis of his question. Could they be from the future? I believe he said. Yeah. Uh, and I added other dimensions. And the four-dimensional universe that we need additional dimensions and that there uh, Fred Allen Wolf uh, has uh, is a, a guy named uh, Bonansky who's uh, the, who's written a book about other dimensions that these beings could come from that was originally Jacques Vallée's idea right. um, that, that they exist in a parallel universe that they pass into our universe uh, so that they, again that would tend to go against trying to you know locate that they're uh, from this or that planet or this or that star in, in our in one or another uh, galaxy that uh, uh, it may be that uh, that they um, exist in some dimension that we don't even understand. Abductees will often say, uh, by the way, during their uh, experiences, as they recall their experiences, this is not occurring in space time as as I know it, and it's hard for them to. They become they find that very difficult to put into words, but uh -huh. the, the the message is consistent that this is not happening in our space-time universe to them. That, that uh, one woman put it, all time dimensions collapsed into one one time, or something like that. In other words, they, <laughs> that we don't have language for it, but that uh, that, there is, that the altered state alters the sense, as they recall the experience, alters the sense of space and time. And I, I think that's a much underappreciated fact. In other words, we're, we're too ready to try to see this thing literally as occurring in our physical universe rather than expanding our notions of reality to other other dimensions, other, other possible universes that uh, uh, that are not simply our physical four-dimensional. All right, well, while we're on that subject, um, I interviewed uh, Mr. Monroe from the Monroe Institute mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, and uh, he talks a great deal about out-of-body travel, uh, mm -hmm. which is clearly some sort of altered state. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it has any relationship uh, to either the altered states that we've been examining tonight uh, or whether the process, the out-of-body uh, process, also has some relationship to what we're discussing. The um, uh, argument against that uh, that uh, Bud Hopkins and others have used is that the people are really gone. In other words, it's, uh, it's not just an out-of-body experience, as he puts it, it's an out-of-the-house experience. Yeah, they're uh, physically gone. They're physically gone, but uh, I don't know that it's either or. In other words, that sometimes uh, uh, people will uh, experience the, themselves floating above their bodies or that they've entered the ship, but they're not sure the body is left. And the, there may be gradations in, in between, that there is a separation of consciousness and the, and the body. That, that, that has been the experience of a number of people. Now, uh, again, um, all kinds of tricks of consciousness seem to occur in this phenomenon, and it's, uh, it's not just, I don't believe, and I, again, I, much more research needs to be done. I, I don't believe it's simply literally that the person is uh, physically re removed. I, I think there's maybe something to be learned from the out-of-body uh, 
you know, out of body studies, but uh, I, I don't know more about that. All right. Uh, on the uh, toll free line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Good evening. Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Bryce in Wichita Art. Uh, Hi, Bryce. Uh, Hi. Uh, Dr. Mack, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, uh, I remember you. reading a long time ago, and I'm, I've been trying to find it. Carl Jung um, kind of prophesied that there'd be a, a, a big surge of uh, uh, flying saucer sightings and and contactees and such. Mm -hmm. And he he attributed more to to spiritual beings uh, than he did to aliens. Have you? Well, yeah, he wrote a. This was before the abduction uh, syndrome had been identified, but he. He he wrote uh, about flying saucers and saw them as as what he called psychoid phenomena. So it was something which uh, exists in the psycho spiritual realm, but shows up in the physical realm and is perceived by by people. And as it breaks down the barrier between the the spiritual, the the psychological, and the physical, it's the crossover phenomenon. And I think there's a lot to that. And as I I, I, mean, I think one of the one of the most extraordinary aspects of this, and I think one of the things that's kind of gotten, going back to my critics, we've gotten people so mad, is that uh, there's kind of a, we've created a kind of sacred barrier between the, you know, spiritual domain and the physical domain, as if they should never meet, you know, it's just kind of like separation of church and state, and in fact, I've even been accused of uh, breaking down the, Mm -hmm. The distinction of church and state, and opening the doors to fascism uh, by by my uh, uh, saying that this is both spiritual and physical at the in, in the, at the same time. In other words, that uh, this does that it 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 uh, crosses that sacred barrier. Something that should be in the unseen realm, should be in the spiritual realm, should be mythic, should be uh, beings that are part of the imagination, or that we would study in uh, departments of anthropology. Uh, but that it shows up in this hard-edged way in the in our physical world. That's a that's a that's a crime against humanity from the standpoint of the Western worldview. Do you think you're beginning to cross that barrier, uh, Doctor, because of hard evidence in your research, or because of a kind of desperation to explain the inexplicable? I, I think I think that we simply don't have another way to think about it. In other words, that that. Um, you're dealing with something that does show up in the physical world. I mean, we do have physical evidence. It's not as good as the critics would like. But then, you know, I want to say something about that. You know, the critics keep demanding, you know, good physical evidence. But, you know, I've had people admit that they just it didn't, wouldn't matter what physical evidence we had. They just wouldn't believe it because it can't be. In other words, that if a piece of a UFO were found in a field by a teenage boy, they'd examine the teenage boy, find him psychotic and unreliable, and That's destroy right. the pedigree. They actually did find, you know, in, in a crop uh, formation in Germany, a plate that uh, was dug up in the crop formation, which had all the same symbols on it that the crop formation itself had. Hmm. And this is, this plate has been studied, analyzed, found to have metals in it that that uh, are peculiar and haven't been found anyplace else. And that has not gotten the publicity that uh, uh, that you would think that it had, because it is the smoking gun, it is the uh, physical artifact that they're all asking for. But so what they do in that case is just not pay that much attention to it. I mean, that's that would be the... The exact thing that they're asking for, uh, the critics ask for, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, if we're not ready for it, it's like the, you know, meteorites. In, in uh, the, the the scientists who discovered meteorites in in Europe uh, repressed the evidence for 39 years because he thought he would be ridiculed if he said that uh, objects could fall from the sky. All right, uh, Doctor, we're going to pause there. We're at the top of the hour, so rest for about six or seven minutes. When we come back. We're going to tell people how to get your book, all right? Okay. All right, Dr. Mack, stay right there. Professor, Harvard professor, John Mack is my guest. Fascinating session. Uh, still plenty of time to get in if you would like to. We've got another hour to go. You're listening to a Sunday evening dreamland on the CBC Radio Network. I'm Art Bell.
Kingdom of Nye. We continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295. 727 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Now once again, here I am. My guest is Harvard professor John Mack, and we're talking about uh, human abductions by aliens. And uh, we'll get back to Dr. Mack in just a moment. would also like to tell everybody out there, you can get a copy of tonight's uh, Dreamland program or any Dreamland program in the entire series by calling area code 503-664-7966. Let me give that to you one more time. Uh, to, to obtain a copy of this program or any Dreamland segment, you can call area code 503-664-7966. Back now to Harvard professor John Mack. Uh, professor Mack, what is the title of your book? Uh, it's called Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens. Pretty uh, straightforward. Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens. And uh, where, uh, I, I take it it is a, uh, a compilation of uh, a lot of the research. Yeah, uh, it, it, the first two chapters are overviews of the um, the phenomenon as uh, I and others have, have described it, um, both historically and, and in terms of the actual, what an actual abduction experience is, is like. And then there are 13 cases that I've seen that uh, illustrate various aspects of the uh, of the phenomenon. The cases tend to get more complex and um, deeper into the meaning of the phenomenon as as one goes through the book. And the last chapter is um, kind of a blue sky uh, look at what the whole thing might mean, what its implications are for psychology, for the human future, for ecology, mm -hmm. for um, our spiritual development, that kind of thing, which uh, is uh, not not factual necessarily, but derives from the cases themselves. All right. Who publishes? Scribner's. And where can folks get it? Well, I hope they can get it in any bookstore in their town. If they if they can't, I hope they'll tell their book dealers to try to get it. Uh, but it's fairly widely available. I think so. All right. Uh, very good. Uh, I think anybody who's been abducted or is concerned about the phenomenon would certainly go out and get it. Uh, I'm sure it's... Uh, uh, and I'd, li I'd very much like to read it myself. I have not yet, Dr. Mack. Um, uh, hi there. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Professor Mack. Uh, good evening. This is Fritz from Phoenix Calling. Yes, Fritz. Uh, mine is more like a statement. Uh, in the early 40s, Dr. Wilhelm Reich, a scientist way ahead of its time, was researching cosmic energy. He was finding an energy field he called organ energy. Mm -hmm. Now, the government destroyed his life work, put the books away, put him in prison where Dr. Reich mysteriously died. Now, today, with the global shrinking constantly, the information is exchanged faster than ever. We are on a higher level of understanding. Now, Dr. Mack, the ball is in your court. Run with it. The reward will be unimaginable. Do what Dr. Reich couldn't do. Well, thank you. I mean, it, it's not as if there isn't an awful lot of... What that Actually, what that uh, interesting call gets us into is the whole question of what is the resistance in this culture to accepting mm -hmm. that something important is going on. Mind you, that doesn't mean we understand it. That doesn't mean we know what these energies are or what these beings are or what their ultimate purpose is. But it seems to me that that it's worth looking at why this uh, uh, creates so much controversy, why on the one hand people deny it, why they want to find anything but, and it's what, uh, I mean, you know, you say, well, it's threatening, but, but why is it threatening and how is it threatening? Well, the unknown is always threatening, always but, a little frightening. But, but what makes this more unknown than anything else? I mean, we, we've never really understood life itself or why we're here or what, what death is like, or what happens uh, beyond uh, the the earth. I mean, it seems to me that if uh, if we're connected with other intelligences in the universe, that isn't any more frightening than being uh, totally uh, isolated on a in a dead universe, which is what uh, you know, with nothing but energy and matter. Uh, you know, I mean that 
it seems to me that there would be uh, it would be a subject of, of, of fascination. You know, I, I just wonder why there is such a uh, you know a terrific. Uh, well, what kind of answers do you come up with? Is it uh, is it is it religious based? Uh, is it some some other part of our social structure? Where? I think it has to do with uh, what you were talking about earlier, the, the need to feel that we're somehow uh, in control. I sometimes call it the Astrodome mentality, you know, that we can <laughs> somehow uh, wall ourselves off from nature and yes. uh, control nature and, uh, and uh, that we're the top of the uh, intelligence pecking order in the cosmos. And uh, not only does this show that we're not at the top, that there's other intelligences probably far greater than our own, in certain capacities anyway, uh, but they can also do with us what they will, or take us against our will, and uh, and uh, show us that we're not in control. I mean, I, I think Well, maybe one could suggest, Doctor, there's not enough evidence uh, to support that egotistical sort of narrow view either. What do you mean? Well, in other words... Um, uh, that we are alone, that we are the only intelligence. Um, that's an egotistical sort of protective sort of view, and uh, there's really not enough evidence to support that either, and, and rarely do I hear it challenged that way. It's I think that's well put. In other words, that the burden of proof is always put on, the, that's right. on somebody that says that there is other intelligence in the universe, whereas that seems to me it ought to be the other way around. Well, or at least equally challenged. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway. I mean, I, I think that... A, that an I don't know attitude might be the healthiest one. Mm -hmm. On the wild card line, you're on the air with uh, Professor John Mack. Hi. Uh, I would like Dr. Mack to describe the circumstances of how he first became associated with financier Lawrence Rockefeller. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, how about that? Are you ra wrapped up uh, with Rocky? I know Lawrence Rockefeller. I mean, he's, uh, I've known him for a number of years. Uh, who have known other members of his family. He's been interested in work that I've done and have been to meetings, uh, you know, that uh, he's, you know... Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you where that I caught. Don't, I don't understand the question. Well, I do, uh, Dr. Mack. Uh, anytime uh, Do uh, Mr. Rockefeller is mentioned, it's always with respect to a giant conspiracy theory. And uh, so I'm sure they're uh, kind of wondering if you're not some sort of foot soldier in this new one-world order business uh, that they suspect uh, Mr. Rockefeller is wrapped up in. Uh -huh. Is that the idea? Yeah, I'm sure it is. Okay. Um, so, what do you say to that? Well, I mean, I, I just don't... Uh, I don't know of any such... I'm not familiar with any such conspiracy. I mean, as <laughs> Mr. Rockefeller is somebody that has been interested in human consciousness, human development, a very... Uh, quite a progressive... Uh, unusual thinker, but I don't know of his being part of any. Uh, I know he's interested in the UFO phenomenon, and I, but I don't know of any uh, of his being part of any kind of uh, conspiracy. All right, good. On the uh, on the toll free line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Hello, where are you calling from, please? Hello there. No, you're not. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Yes, I have two questions. All right, where where are you? Oregon. Oregon. All right. Uh, first of all. Anecdotally, uh, there's been talk about implants made by uh, these beings into human abductees, uh, either in their ears or their uh, nose. I was wondering if the doctor has uh, learned anything about that in the studies. And the second uh, question is... Uh, All right, you're on a portable phone, sir, and it sounds terrible. Okay, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, turned around. All right, implants and what else? And... Uh, also, anecdotally, there all of the abductions, at least what I hear about, come from people that are either in their cars on a lonely road at night or are in their bedrooms at night uh, and never just off of a busy street corner or something like that. Um, what does the doctor say about that? Well, all right. I, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to answer the two questions together because um, they both have to do with the, the matter of subtlety. Okay, the the implants. I mean, there was a time uh, when when I was first starting out, and I heard of, with this was about five years ago, and and I I heard about these implants, and then I I got uh, recovered a wiry object from the nose of a woman I was working with, and I heard of several other implants that had been uh, found from, like you say, from people's uh, orifices of people's bodies, and 
And I thought, wow, this is going to give us that, that smoking gun. You know, this is going to prove that something, you know, bizarre is going on here. And, uh, the, you know, there'll be some unusual elements that will be found in strange combinations or that are not found on Earth and that kind of thing. Well, actually, that has not proven to be the case. There have been several implants that have found following abduction, small particle objects that have been uh, looked at carefully. David Pritchard at MIT has examined one. Uh, but they haven't uh, been shown to contain uh, any unusual combinations of elements. Uh, they, uh, again, um, whatever is at work here is not handing us a smoking gun. It's a subtle phenomenon. And I, I think that applies to, to the other question as well. Uh, is that, that you don't have a situation, and he's quite correct, where you and I are walking along the street, uh, a UFO uh, hovers... Uh, over the street, uh, 100, 200 yards away, and zap, uh, several pedestrians walking along are floated up in the sky before uh, us and and, uh, and all of uh, downtown uh, Boston, Las Vegas, or whatever. That does not happen. He's quite correct. It, it happens. Uh, usually, there have been cases where more than one person has been taken. There are mm -hmm. several quite well-known case in Nebraska where several people were taken uh, from an amusement park. It's not always cars. It's not always uh, the, um, you know, from the bedroom. There, there's been children that Bud Hopkins has described taken from schoolyards. Uh, the one woman who was, uh, I've talked with myself was uh, taken off a snowmobile in a field. I mean, there are unusual situations, uh, but they tend to be relatively difficult to get a vivid documentation of the abduction itself. In other words, it tends to occur with a certain amount of disguise. And I, I, I answer the two questions together because I think it points to the fact that the phenomenon has a good deal of subtlety. In other words, it doesn't satisfy us in the kind of gross material way we want. And I, I don't know the, know the reason for that. I, mean, I think we're, we're, it's there, there's evidence for it, there's a lot that can't be explained, but it, you know, it's not uh, as if a... Um, you know, a fleet of UFOs uh, came down over Washington and just uh, floated up the Congress or something. You know? mm -hmm. All right. Um, very good. That's a good answer. On the uh, toll-free line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Where are you calling from, please? Hello there. No, you're not. On the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Hello. Hi there. Um, where, where are you, ma'am? This is Carolyn from San Diego. Okay. Um, I like to ask Dr. Mack if he's anybody he has worked with has experienced something called sleep paralysis. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Uh, is that pretty common with people who've been abducted? Well, the, this sleep paralysis is uh, associated often with with a syndrome called narcolepsy, where the person is. is uh, uh, body is, is paralyzed or they suddenly fall asleep uh, unexpectedly they can't stay awake um, and uh, you know in, in a certain instances the, these individuals uh, do have some aspects that look like sleep paralysis in other words that, they're, that they uh, wake up and they, they can't move but there's a whole set of other phenomena that go along with that in other words uh, in, this, in these situations you have uh, these little beings with the dark eyes around the bed that are consistently described. The person is, uh, experiences being floated down the hall, through the wall, up into the sky, procedures done in the UFO, and these stories quite consistently told. And I talked, there's a Dr. Anch in the St. Louis area who's an expert in sleep paralysis, and I, I uh, spoke with him about this, and I have spoke with other experts who actually study sleep paralysis, and they say that it doesn't... Uh, contain all the dimensions that are found in the abduction syndrome. So it's one, I mean, often we find that, you know, that, that somebody will, will take one aspect of this whole syndrome and say, well, maybe that's what it's about, you know, mm -hmm. or they say, for example, that the UFOs are sort of uh, womb-like, so maybe this is a recollection of a birth experience or something of that kind, or is it take one aspect and then make a whole theory out of it. All right. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Where are you calling from, please? Calling from Seattle. Seattle, yes, ma'am. Hi, Art. Hi, Dr. Mack. Hi. Hi. Hey, this whole thing is totally weird, right? But I was just wondering, I want to ask Dr. Mack, what is, if, if you can pinpoint the single most weird 
thing that stands out in your mind about this whole abduction phenomena? All right. The single most weird. The, the, the weirdest, uh, the weirdest aspect or a strangest aspect of it, I suppose. It seems the whole thing is strange. But is there anything that stands out? Well, I think it's the capacity of these beings, whatever they are, to create all kinds of confusing um, theatrical elements. You know, as people describe on the ship, suddenly a part of the ship will turn into a theater or a forest, hmm. uh, or they'll uh, find themselves uh, walking uh, down long corridors. You know, is that, that there's some that there there are that the, the capacity of the of this intelligence, whatever it is, to to uh, manufacture experiences for people which we cannot tell whether they in what dimension they are what reality they are and it was a, the, the inside of a ship can turn into something much larger much smaller it's, a, it, it's the the degree to which this seems to be able to play with space time physical reality that, uh, that I find extraordinary Dr. Mack this may be off topic or there may be a relationship a lot of people doing research into near death experiences uh, a lot of testimony from physicians saying, well, look, this whole story about going down a long, dark corridor toward a point of light and all the rest of it is easily explainable um, as the brain dies, uh, the synapses uh, start dying from the outside toward the center, and therefore the light is toward the center. Um, and they try to explain it in that manner. One... Do you see any relationship between NDE and the possibility of another dimension with regard to these uh, aliens? And uh, how do you um, uh, how do you feel about that ex that physical explanation of the phenomena? Well, I, I think it would be hard to. I mean, there's, uh, Michael Sebum, who's a cardiologist who's uh, studied the um, uh, near death experiences, has several cases where uh, people who were uh, otherwise, uh, in the coma, um, have actually been able to uh, have their consciousness floated above the operating table, reported uh, right. what the surgeons were wearing, reported what uh, was on the instruments, uh, uh, in the, uh, the anesthesia instruments in the, uh, in the OR, uh, or they could even see what was going on down the corridor with relatives of theirs. I mean, it's a, the near-death experience has a whole lot of, um, elements to it which are difficult to explain purely in terms of the phenomenon of the dying brain and I uh, I mean the, the the consistency with which people report complex extremely powerful vivid encounters uh, with light and with uh, relatives and with beings down this tunnel uh, uh, which they experience as altogether in a reality uh, I don't know if, I mean it doesn't it's just uh, why would the dying brain necessarily throw off that kind of experience? We don't uh, know. We don't have much other evidence of a dying brain creating that kind of uh, complex and re and replicable experience. So I don't know. I mean, I I guess I, I'm, I'm I'm reaching out looking for some commonality in these varying described altered states. I wonder if there is any commonality in them. Well, I think that they all they all involve the question of whether there can be a consciousness separated from the body or the brain, or whether um, you know whether there can be experiences that are uh, not simply explainable in the ordinary um, physiological way. You know, is that there's a what uh, Dr. Stan Stanislav Goff calls transpersonal experiences, where our our nature or our being or our existence can travel outside of our brains or outside of our uh, present limits of, of reality. I mean, I think that's, it has that element in common. Um, Dr. Mack, what do you think, um, as you look down the research road, um, will finally put this thing in a box so that we can understand it? Will anything ever do that? Will it be physical evidence? Uh, or do you think that these alternative areas of research 
uh, will finally prove to be the key to unlock all this? Well, I, I mean, I, <laughs> that's a very good question. I, I think we need to study how this shows up in other countries, uh, how widespread it is. I think if we create an atmosphere in which people feel free to speak up, to uh, uh, report their experiences increasingly, where abductees are, are, uh, are, are not so afraid as they are now that they're going to be... Uh, lose their jobs or be humiliated, uh, that will help because we'll have more cases. I think if, if uh, I'd like to see many more clinicians, psychiatrists uh, come into this. Uh, I'm increasingly getting letters from psychiatrists and psychologists who have cases and who are beginning to recognize this and not try to put people into particular pigeonholes. I think we need to establish once and for all that if that can be done, that uh, there is no obvious psychological explanation for this doing by doing careful personality assessment. Some of that has been, been done. I would think by the time a clinician comes to you, for example, he would be sort of at his last, uh, uh, last hope. In other words, uh, he, he would have reached out to every other conventional psychiatric uh, uh, road that he could and then be coming to you as a final desperate move. Is that typical? Well, I often do see uh, clinicians who uh, begin to suspect that they can't explain their cases, but until recently it was more likely to be that the person themselves would leave a psychologist that was trying to put them into a particular uh, category. I, uh, very often, the, uh, because there is this uh, sexual reproductive aspect to the encounter, a lot of uh, times the, the, the mental health professional will be looking for a... Um, a history of sexual abuse, which can be uh, doubly harmful because it, it not only uh, is barking up the wrong tree sometimes, but it also uh, will tend to uh, sow distrust between uh, uh, family members uh, unnecessarily. So um, that, that can be a particular problem. All right. All right. Dr. Mack, hold on. We'll be back to you. We're at the half-hour mark. You're listening to Dreamland. My guest is Harvard professor John Mack. Remember to get a copy of this program or any other Dreamland program. Call area code 503-664-7966, 24 hours a day. Free line, you're on the air with uh, uh, Dr. Mack. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from KVI in Seattle. Yes, ma'am. Um, Dr. Mack, has any abductee that you've ever discussed um, abduction with ever told you that a medical doctor has advised them that they, during a skull x-ray or isotope scan, had had laser surgery on their skull without I don't know the skin skull, part? But I, I, I've certainly uh, uh, had a situation where somebody had, a, say, an implant in the nose or a, uh, one man who had a, a very... Uh, uh, a major kind of uh, cut in his nose following an abduction, and then it uh, healed up in a couple of days, and the, a man looked in his nose and said, there must be some extraordinary uh, uh, surgery went on here, you know, I mean, that this, this was uh, healed up so fast. Or uh, there people be asked, uh, have you had any surgery, in other cases, have you had any surgery done to your nose or to your mouth. I had this kind of question asked me in 1976 oh. during the isotope scan, yeah. and I had no skin scarring, but I was shown an incision that the doctor claimed was a, or shown, you know, the isotope scan thing on the, whatever the, those white things was during the scan, yeah. uh, that I had a size of about a half dollar circle on my right skull, yeah. and I told him I'd never had any skull surgery. Yes. And, have, you, have, um, you had a, have you had experiences? I've had a lot of experiences. Yes. I'm afraid well, I'm an abductee. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if you are or you aren't, but I certainly... What I've seen a man of light. Is, I've, I've had miracles, you know, what? where I've... Uh, uh, she's saying she's seen a man of light. Yeah. On January the 1st of 1957, he awakened me in my apartment. I had a child dying in Children's Hospital and another child down with a croup, and I was sleeping in the living room. He was six foot eight. Uh, because he touched the door jam, and he filled the whole apartment with light. Obviously, I recognized him because I said to him, I can't go with you now. Can't you see my children are both sick? He just disappeared, and my ex-husband, my former spouse, 
jumped up and asked me how I turned on and off the lights in the entire apartment. And I said, I didn't. And I told him about the man of light. Mm -hmm. He thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, a, I mean, that's what I was referring earlier to the taller, luminous beings that some people have experience with. Yeah. I take it you don't think that these aliens are... Um, are, are dangerous to us, that that they're basically benign, Doctor? No, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, one of the difficulties for us human beings is we, we tend to be rather species-centered, uh, you know, in a kind of egotistical way. We were talking about that earlier, and I was like, yes. I think it might be that they are, from our point of view, uh, neither benign nor malignant, that it, it may be that we are in some way uh, so radically out of balance with nature that uh, that this involves, as one of the abductees put it, uh, a, some kind of cosmic correction, which we find unpleasant and which is inconsiderate from the human point of view. But uh, when you consider the fact that human beings are the cause of the elimination of countless living species uh, every day that we live and breathe, uh, I mean, eliminate completely other species, the fact that we would be in some ways inconvenienced by uh, by uh, another force that's that's involved in some sort of cosmic correction uh, is uh, hardly uh, you know of, of a great moment compared to the destruction that that we bring on the earth in in any given day you know to all right, it, it, as all well right. as to uh, other species doctor so, it brings on this question uh, would it be your view that our industrial uh, society has um, gone the wrong route in development. In other words, uh, in developing ourselves uh, the way we have uh, industrially, have we done it the wrong way? Well, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I don't, uh, it's a little hard for me to get into this sort of kind of pious quarterbacking kind of role. I, uh, I mean, but when you think about it, uh, there is something a little bit bizarre uh, about you know, if you step back, and I think one of the things that studying this phenomenon has allowed me to do is to kind of step back and look at ourselves a little more objectively. And the idea that one species should uh, appropriate to itself the entire Earth and divide it up into sections and call those countries and lands and claim that we own it. I mean, that's, uh, you know, native peoples uh, in the, haven't been quite as territorial as we are, but uh, it's a, it, it, it is... Uh, rather strange that this species should should treat this earth that way i mean and uh you can say well it's natural because we've had the ability to do it but it it evidently is whatever uh whatever is uh the right and the wrong of it it's uh it's it, it is creating some kind of a ripple which is extending uh, beyond the earth uh and um that's again the way i was raised that would be a very hard thing to to believe that that anything that we did to the earth could have an effect beyond the earth and bring forth some kind of of reaction but that seems to be what's going on in other words it seems that this is, these beings or these species or whatever it is uh, the various alien beings are coming to the earth in response to the that's what they say i mean they, it's what they communicate telepathically in response to uh the fact that that uh we seem to have taken it upon ourselves to, to destroy the earth itself. All right. Um, on, on our wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Mack. Where are you calling from, please? San Jose, California. San Jose, all right. Yeah. Uh, John, I uh, sent a videotape of my daughter uh, to Bud Hopkins mm -hmm. uh, of her taking the Hopkins image recognition test. Yes. Oh, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Last time I talked to Bud, he said he was going to forward that on to you. Yeah, I heard that. I saw that. I was just wanting your feelings on that and I wanted to see if you can give some advice to parents that are going through this well first of all uh, yeah I mean I was very moved by the by the tape he showed that at a conference actually uh, and then I, I saw it privately with, with him um, um, yeah I mean I, I saw the reaction of the child when that that uh, image appeared I mean she really became very upset and the uh, in the alien picture. Did, uh, for the audience that doesn't know what he's referring to, uh, Bud Hopkins has developed, as an artist, has developed ten cards which have pictures of typical things that kids would know, you know, a boy, a girl, a 
firemen, a witch, a skeleton, a batman, a ninja turtle, etc., and uh, an alien. And uh, uh, it's very dramatic when you show kids these pictures, they recognize them and go along merrily. And then when you show them the, the abductee children, you show them the alien card and they recoil and suddenly they, they express intense emotion, become very distressed, want to cling to their parents and point and say, that's the one. In other words, that's the one that takes them up into the ship. And when you see that, you, you have a lot of trouble uh, attributing this to the imagination, you know. Um, and I, I think that uh, the advice to parents I would give is don't dismiss the child who tells you that they've been taken in the night by strange beings up into a planet or, they, or into the sky, rather, or into a ship. Uh, listen to them. Don't tell them it's a nightmare or it's a dream. Uh, talk to them and uh, take it seriously. Uh, sir, is this uh, how your daughter reacted to this test? Yes. It is. How is she now? She's still having uh, bad dreams. She calls it bad dream. She's still having visitations. All right, I, I thank you. Um, what kind of advice do you offer somebody like that, Doctor? Well, I, again, I don't know... Um his community. What what community are you in? I, I'm sorry. He's in San Jose. He's gone now. San yeah, Jose. Well, I mean, I, I, again, it depends. I don't know in San Jose who the pediatricians or child psychiatrists or other child mental health people are and who might be open to taking this seriously. I, I had an experience in Cambridge where I there was a child psychiatrist I, I you know, referred a three-year-old boy to uh, who was having uh, uh, abduction experiences and... Um, you know, I, I wanted him to be open and to take it seriously, and and this and he uh, uh, examined this little boy and uh, concluded that he was a healthy little boy except for these experiences. Mm -hmm. But because he had no place in his worldview for uh, such a uh, such a matter, he proceeded to uh, uh, grill the family about other kinds of you know trauma, abuse within the family, and it really upset the family. You know. Um, I hope we're getting to the time when we can accept this, uh, even though we don't understand it and it's mysterious and it's not supposed to be, at least accept it for what it is and not try to continuously, uh, uh, you know, uh, disturb people by trying to uh, make it something else. Sure. Force it uh, to be something else. I guess it's our inclination to do that because uh, it frightens us in a way. On the, on the toll free line, you're on the air with Dr. John Mack. Hi. Hi, Art. This is Jim in St. Louis. Yes, Jim. Uh, Dr. Mack, I had a couple questions for you uh, regarding, um, I believe it was uh, last year, 93, there was an idea put forth by uh, Richard Hoagland, a uh, series of meetings, a summit, if you will, of people doing real research who had amassed lots of information, data. Um, good stuff, numbers. Um, you came on t uh, 48 Hours a while back and talked about other dimensions, whereas he has earned the Angstrom Medal for his work in the physics of other dimensionality, and he has raised the charge that repeatedly, consistently, you have, starting with the, uh, I guess it was in late uh, in 93, you have decided to shun, uh, to turn away and deny any of the, uh, any of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, information that they have amassed. You had stated categorically at one meeting um, to the other researchers, um, we will never really know, um, and there will never be any hard evidence. It's also, I think I understand that you were given a grant of $100,000 as well as John Greer by the same person. And it seems to me, it sounds as though um, you seem to, somebody is playing politics here, and a short time thereafter, you were politicking against these summit meetings of people with, um, to doing hard research. All right. Uh, I, I mean, that's simply not true. I mean, I, I have nothing against doing hard research. Uh, Richard Hoagland's work is on the faces on Mars, the face on Mars. It doesn't have to do with the abduction story. I think that the abduction story is elusive. In other words, I think that, that to get physical evidence that's going to give us that smoking gun that's going to prove that uh, this exists in our world as we know it, I think it's going to be very difficult. I, I don't, I'm not against that. I think it's, it's important to, to amass as much physical evidence as we can. I, it's just simply what the man is saying is not true. I have not politicked against 
uh, getting the physical evidence. I think the physical evidence is extremely important. It's just very difficult to get hard evidence around the abduction story, and that, and I think that we have to be careful not to call something hard evidence when we're not sure. All right. Um, I like to ask researchers this question, Dr. Mack. If you had the smoking gun that you've been talking about that we all want, um, how hard would you think about the advisability of making it public before you did so? Well, it depends who makes it public. I mean, again, you know, what would be a smoking gun? What would satisfy? I mean, the, you know, the, the, uh, the debunkers say, well, we have to have a... Uh, you know, a physical artifact off of a UFO. Well, we may not get that, uh, but if we, what I was describing earlier, which was this uh, uh, object that was found in the, in Germany in the earth, where the which replicated in its symbols the actual shape of the uh, of the uh, crop formation. Now, uh, for that to be acceptable, uh, it, the pedigree of the object has to be impeccable. In other words, it has to be studied. It has to be clear that it wasn't uh, made by somebody, and that that would take a great deal of time. But that that object seems very promising. It was you know it was shown on the television program Encounters, and it's been studied in Germany, and, and yet it's gotten very little attention. I mean, I I think that this thing is it's going to move not just with the physical evidence because there's a great deal of resistance to accepting the whole phenomenon, but also to the to the state of consciousness of the culture, and there's the willingness of the culture to acknowledge uh, that something's going on. I mean, the, the crop formations is a good example. I mean, some of them are extraordinarily subtle and interesting yes. and uh, complex and uh, and uh, involve this strange laying down of the of the wheat in 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 very irregular patterns with the. Uh, the wheat stalks burned at a, and swollen at exactly the same place, all of them. I mean, and yet, in spite of these, ex, ex, and they can be complex symbols uh, uh, which have fractal-like formations in them and, and, and extraordinary beauty. And yet, uh, the British public, uh, for instance, where the, the most complex ones have been found, uh, is told constantly that uh, this is a hoax and it's not real, and, and yet the evidence seems to, from people like Colin Andrews and George Wingfield that, that the evidence is overwhelming that there's some uh, mysterious intelligence at work here, but we're not ready to accept it. So I think that this field will progress as much through our openness to accepting it, the shift in our consciousness around such phenomena, as it will in terms of the physical evidence. They'll go together. All right, and then there, then there is this. Uh, for a second, working with the theory, there may be a parallel universe. That is another place in space and time uh, occupied um, by beings uh, who are actually on our same physical Earth, but just in a different place or time or dimension. Uh, there would not be a surprise, would there, that any physical recovered object would have properties similar to those on this Earth because, in fact, it came from this Earth. Yeah, and I mean, and if, uh, for example, the implants, I mean, if you're going to, if you, if you're assuming that these beings do in fact exist and that they, in some form, and that they do in fact uh, do physical things or uh, place particles in the body, it wouldn't be surprising if these objects were compatible with the body tissues and mm -hmm. that they would not be uh, something that couldn't, be in the human body, they would be rejected by the human body, or that they, if they wanted to disguise themselves, they wouldn't necessarily uh, offer us something that could be readily uh, analyzed as strange and bizarre and that kind of thing. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, the whole thing is very elusive, it's very complex, it is mysterious, it is subtle, and, uh, you know, we're going to, the, the way I see it is we're going to have to stretch to meet it as much as it's going to hand us any easy answers. Tell me something. If you could do it all over again and not take this road and not begin investigating these things, would you, uh, would you, would you avoid the road? No, I wouldn't. I mean, I think it's the most interesting story going on on the planet right now, and uh, I, I guess I often wonder why more people don't jump in. I suppose it's because uh, it is so elusive, and it, it doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't conform to the uh, requirements of, of the physical sciences mm. in a way that uh, satisfies people. It cuts across disciplines, it, and um, 
And yet, I mean, if we are in fact uh, being reached by some other kind of intelligence, I mean, what could be more more interesting than that? What could indeed, um, Doctor? We're out of time. Tell us one more time uh, the name of your book and generally where we can get it. Oh, the the book also. Um, I wanted to, something else. I wanted to do. Uh, the book is called Abduction: Human Encounters with Aliens. It's in most bookstores. Also, I would like to hear from people if they want to write to me. If they're still on the line after all this. All right, um, quickly give us an address. Uh, write to me at uh, John Mack, uh, the Cambridge Hospital, fourteen ninety three Cambridge Street, Cambridge, Mass. O two one three nine. And they should say if they write that they uh, if they want information or, or that they uh, heard me on this program, so we know that. All right, give the address once more. Okay, uh, it's Dr. John Mack, M A C K, uh, the Cambridge Hospital, fourteen ninety three Cambridge Street, Cambridge, Mass. O two one three nine. Doctor, it has been a pleasure having you on, and I hope that we can do it again. Yeah, good. Thanks, Art. Thanks, John. Bye, bye. That's Dr. John Mack. And uh, I am sorry, we are absolutely out of time, only enough time for me to tell you um, that uh, we would, of course, love to have you order a copy of this program, a very informative program with Dr. Mack, or any other Dreamland program that we have aired in the entire series. You can do so 24 hours a day by calling area code 503-664-5433. Six six five zero three six six four seven nine six six. Thank you, and good night. This has been Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland.